the meeting. Um, so welcome everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. I think maybe a few more people will be uh, joining as we go. Um, but I wanted to, uh, we wanted to have this introductory beginners workshop to help people um, get started with R and R Studio. And um, we, uh, well, I'm gonna give a talk today uh, going over the basics of programming in R, um, using R Studio, how to make data visualizations and plots in R, and um, we'll use the example CSV data set that I uh, attached to an email earlier today um, that is from the data.boston.gov uh, website about uh, women owned businesses in Boston. So I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen and just go like really from the beginning. So if you have RStudio installed, then you can open RStudio and we'll just talk about what you're seeing um, first when you do that. Um, and if there's questions, feel free to uh, pop them in the chat or just get my attention and ask me those questions. They may be things that I have like a longer answer to or can't really like troubleshoot in real time. And so I may have to say like, I think we're gonna have to try and like come back to that question in the Q&A session and please remind me of your question then. Um, but if you have something that you think I can sort out like right then, um, please feel free to ask. So um, if all of you can see my screen, I've opened our studio. I'm just gonna make it a little bit bigger. And then um, let's talk about what these different panels are in our studio. So on the left-hand side, this is the console where um, you're seeing just after we opened our studio, it's telling us some pretty basic uh, general information about your R install. So it's including like the R installation version number, when that's from, um, some information about the fact that R is free software. Um, and it also tells you about how to access certain demos and help um, just by running these commands. And then over here on the right hand side, on the uh, top right corner, we have this pan, this pane for the environment. And when we start uh, running our code, we're gonna see our variables uh, show up in that environment pane and it's gonna essentially just help us keep track of all the things that we've created in R. Um, and there's a couple other tabs on here. There's history. Once you have uh, started running R code, you'll see that like the history appears there. There's connections for connecting to databases and there's this tutorial pane. Uh, we're not really gonna mess with those a lot today. The environment pane um, is just handy to know about. Um, then in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see that RStudio opens to wherever your home directory is on your computer. So that'll be a little bit different depending on like if you're um, on a Mac or a Windows or a Linux machine, um, but uh, we'll uh, be using this uh, pane to navigate through different directories later. Um, and it's helpful to just be able to see the files that you're working with in this uh, pane. There's also a couple other tabs in this pane for plots, packages, help, and the viewer. And we'll be using those a bit today. So um, the first thing that I think everyone should do in our studio when you're getting started is you should make a new project for um, what you're doing. And so for today, I'm just gonna make like a project called introduction or intro to R. Um, and so I'm gonna create that project in a new directory and I'm just gonna do that on my desktop. So I click new project, and then these are just some extra features that we could have with our project. I really just want a regular project. So I'm clicking new project again, and um, I'm gonna put intro to R here, and I'm gonna put this on my desktop. And you don't really need to worry about these other options. They're just um, more advanced features that you don't necessarily need when you're getting started. So if you just make a new project and call it something like intro or intro to R, that would be great for getting started. And then um, you'll see that the RStudio window refreshes, it's opening up the project. And now this file panel, this files panel in the bottom right, you'll see that now we're in uh, my home directory, then desktop, then intro to R because we've made this new project. And if you wanted to you know, close this or open a different project, there's this drop down for the projects that you could go to. And you can see we've got, uh, we're in this intro to R 
as indicated up here. And um, before we do anything else, I have this women-owned uh, women -owned businesses that CSV file that I'm just gonna put in there. I'm just gonna drag and drop it from where I had it on my desktop and you'll see it shows up there. So we'll be using that in a second. And then um, I'll pause there. Are there any questions? Are people doing like, okay with that? Does that make sense so far? I have one quick question about um, the, yeah. oh, so, so there's no dedicated file that you, uh, or folder rather for uh, what you gonna call them our data uh, data resources you can just create your own and yeah. just navigate to it in the bottom right pane right right what's useful about these projects is that you know they each get their own directory and um, that allows you to keep kind of the files that all go together in one directory not like spread out all over your computer. So you don't have like a data folder with all the data you're using across all your different projects. And then a code folder with like all your different code. You don't do anything like that. You wanna keep like the code and uh, your data together in a project that are related to each other. Rahul, did you have a question? Yes, um, I have a question. Um, um, I've used R before and R Studio. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, uh, I'm familiar with this. The question I have is when you create different directories and uh, you know how in R you can install different libraries. When mm -hmm. you install a library, does it install in all the folders or just in that specific folder then? Oh yeah, so whenever you install a, a package in R, it's available uh, system-wide for, uh, it's typically available to you when you're running R. Um, no matter which project you're in. So once you install it, you should have it for all of your projects. The, uh, the packages don't get duplicated or anything like that. Uh, they're just available, um, installed on the system. Thank you. Is that, okay, great. I'll um, go forward if that answers the questions that were urgent. Okay. Um, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna make a, um, an R uh, script, which I think is, you know, the, the uh, bread and butter of really writing R code. So you can either go to this file, new file, um, and then R script, um, or you can use the shortcut that's here on Mac OS. It's going to be command shift N. Um, I think it's control shift N on Windows and uh, for Linux. Um, so you see, we have this like untitled one file open up. This is now it's a new pane on the left hand side. It's now on the top left corner um, and we can start writing in here. We uh, will put our code in here and, and um, do all of our work today in here. But before we do that, I just wanna save it with um, a name. So I'll just call this intro.r and um, the name updates and you can see now here it's in my bottom right corner and we've got it open over here. So um, I'll just, start with um, a comment about the, what this file is. So um, I'm just gonna put introduction to R here. And uh, this is how you write a comment in R code. You start with a hashtag symbol um, or the pound symbol, and then you can type in anything on that line um, will be ignored by R. And the reason you want comments is really so that you can um, help explain to other people and to yourself later once you've forgotten what your code is doing and what it's about. Um, and so uh, let's get started with um, declaring variables. So the first thing that we're gonna do, I think one of the most common variable names you'll see is something like X or just A or you know just some letter. And then you're gonna have this, um, you're gonna type a space and then this symbol, the uh, less than character and a dash. And then I'm assigning X to be one here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click run and that's gonna run this line. Or I could have done it down here in the console, but um, this way, at least I'm keeping it in my intro.r file. Um, so if you click run or run has a shortcut, which is command enter um, on my system or control enter on most other systems. Um, and you'll see now that I've run it, now that I clicked this run button or uh, entered it into the console and hit enter, you see that X is now defined in this environment pane. And you'll see it has length one, it has value one, you're even getting told it's 56 bytes um, and what type it is, it's a numeric type. 
So um, we can, you know, keep uh, assigning variables like this um, and, you know, keep working with them. We can do um, different kinds of uh, operations with them. And um, I suppose one of the most important things is retrieving the variables. So if you just type in that variable name into the console and hit enter, you can see what the variable uh, name is. And um, so I think before we get uh, too far, I want to point out that you can also assign variables with this equals sign. Um, this is more like most other programming languages, and you may see it uh, from time to time. Like if I update this value, you'll see now in the uh, environment pane x is now two. This works exactly the same as uh, the less than and then the dash, the arrow symbol, but um, it's just not preferred in the R community. Um, people uh, say, and it's I think commonly believed that the arrow makes it more readable as uh, assignment operator because equals gets used for uh, some other things uh, later on down the line that we show you. Um, so we can assign variables that are not just um, numbers, but we can also do things like strings. So um, if I want to define a string, I can uh, use quote marks and you can use either the double quotes or the uh, uh, single uh, quotation mark um, to define strings. And then if you want to like print your string on the console, um, you can uh, use this print command. Um, some other uh, types of variables that you will be interested in are Boolean variables like uh, true and false. So if I run these, you'll see that A is true and B is false. You can negate them with, um, let me write that in the script. You can negate them with the exclamation operator. Um, the space doesn't matter here. You can have uh, not be like this um, with a space or without it. Um, and there's some other logical operators like A or B. You'll see that evaluates to true. Um, and then you could have A and B, which will be false. Um, these are just logical operators that you'll use with um, Boolean values from time to time. Um, and I think while we're talking about uh, declaring variables, I want to talk about some other kinds of um, values that you commonly run across in R that are useful to know about. So there's the uh, NAN, NAN or not a number is what it stands for. This is a value that you can have um, that arises from things like dividing by zero or dividing by infinity or um, things like that um, will give you NANs. And then a different uh, kind of missing value is the NA or not applicable, which is typically used to represent uh, missing numbers. So like if you had someone responding to a survey and they didn't answer a question, you might have NA there. Um, whereas uh, NAN is typically a result of like arithmetic operations gone awry. And then um, the last kind of missing value that's commonly used in R is null, which is really used to indicate that the data is absent. Um, you use null a lot to uh, actually like delete data. So if you're working with lists, like you can set list elements to be null and then that's essentially deleting them. Um, and I want to be able to show, I want you to be able to know what kind of data you're working with. So you can use this class operator, uh, this class function to um, determine the class of different kinds of objects. Oh, and I shouldn't have overwritten C. Oh. Um, I think it'll be okay. Let me just not worry about it for a second. Um, so, and then the other thing I want you to know is that there's also this type of operator that gives you a uh, slightly related but different information from um, the uh, class. So um, type of and class are both functions that will help you determine uh, what kind of uh, variable you're working with. And then the I think one of the most important skills that you um, need to have while you're approaching R is um, to be able to get help. And there's really great documentation pages built into R 
So for pretty much um, any function that you want to know more about, if you type the question mark and then that function, you'll get, uh, you'll see now the bottom right hand side corner uh, pane has gone to the help page. And this uh, includes the name of the function that you looked up, the description, um, the usage, a lot about the arguments and the details. I mean, a lot of the time it's entirely too much information kind of, but it's definitely gonna have um, an explanation of what it is that you're looking at. And oftentimes has really helpful information for where to go um, to learn more, or especially these examples are really useful because they'll help you um, see how uh, other programmers or the programmers who wrote uh, R itself intended for you to use these functions. Is there a question, Kuldeep? Um, yes, question. Thank you so much for all this very uh, valuable information. So I have a quick uh, question in mind. I was like doing the thing as along with you. So I noticed yeah. that I have to uh, click run or control enter every single line. So yeah. it doesn't like whole script in, in sequence. Sure. So is there so, a way to like, make sure that yeah. it comes up every line, not single run? Yes, if you want to do if you want to do the whole script, you use this source button. Oh, I see. Yeah, and this will run the whole script. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. So, I want to point out one more thing about this help function. That's something that I wish I'd learned when I was being introduced to R, because it makes um, the help pages a whole lot more useful or uh, useful in a whole lot more circumstances than I realized originally. There's some things like this arrow operator that it's really hard to get help on at first because if you try to do something like this, it won't work. It tells you like unexpected assignment. What you need to do is to wrap this in the back tick. Uh, and if you aren't familiar, the back tick character, it's the same key as the tilde but don't hold shift and you'll type the back tick. And if you put the back tick on either side of this and then enter, um, now you're actually getting the help page for the assignment operator. And so there's other operators like this that you'll need to do that with. Like if you wanted to learn more about the uh, arithmetic operators, like all the plus minus divide by everything like that, you would have to use this back tick syntax. Um, and really, that's just because this is a function that comes between its arguments instead of in front of its arguments. But um, that's a little bit of a uh, detail I don't want to talk about too much today. But I wanted to let you know about how to get help for some of these um, uh, some of these operators that it's harder to get help for. Um, so now the um, I think we have x. Oh, let me define. Let's talk about. Um, vectors now. So, uh, well, first of all, I mean, we pointed out that you can do, uh, you can do just arithmetic, like x plus y will work, um, and everything like that, pretty much like anything you can think of to put here, this will work. You could assign these to new variables, you can run them to see what they come out to. Um, but really where R draws a lot of its power is the fact that it supports out of the box, working with vectors, working with, um, and what vectors are, are um, uh, variables that contain multiple uh, entries that are all of the same type. So um, I'm just gonna make a set of two vectors um, that will just each contain four numbers. And you'll see I'm using this C uh, uh, function and uh, let's look at the help pages so you can learn more about that. Um, what C does is it combines values into a vector or a list. Um, you can really ignore a list because it almost never does that. Um, you have to provide it some extra parameters to make it do that, but basically no one ever does. But so when you put in C and then these four values, if we look at what X is, um, you'll see it has these four values in it you'll see that in the environment pane, it's saying it's a numeric of length four um, with these four values in it. And um, now we can even do like uh, arithmetic operations um, with X and Y because they're both vectors of the same length. And so this is really useful for, you know, if you're wanting to do like 
a lot of math or linear algebra or something like that that's you know oftentimes important in statistics um this is really the backbone of a lot of that um and then if you want to know like the length of a vector you can use this length command um and to access the individual entries of a vector, you can use this bracket syntax. So if I change what index is in here, you'll see I'm getting, um, in this case, they're just like one, two, three, four. So if I look for the fourth element, it's going to be four. Um, but you can access the elements of a vector with this bracket notation. And um, this bracket is another one of these that if you want to get the help on, you need to use the back tick. Um, so this is actually um, like a function you can look up the help pages for, for like extract or replace parts of an object. And what this is saying about replace parts of an object is saying you can also assign using this syntax. So if I want the fourth element of X to actually be, let's say five instead, now when we look at X, it's one, two, three, five. Um, so that's the basics of vectors. And I really want to stress that vectors, when you use this C um, function to create them, they all are entries of the same type. So in this example, like they were all numbers, um, but I could have like a string vector that's something like this, just three different letters. Um, and you can have vectors of like all different types, but all of the entries have to be the same when you make them. Um, what that's in contrast to is lists. So um, when you make a list, um, that can be different types. So um, we defined a bunch of different things earlier. So I'll just go ahead and use them. Um, I think, did we do A and B and C? Yep. So now if we look at what L is, you'll see L has like true, false, not a number, NA, and null as its um, entries. These are like different types of uh, objects that aren't necessarily the same. Um, and the syntax for accessing them is a little bit, um, well, let me first say, you can use length just the same way as with vectors. So this will tell you that there's five entries in your list. Um, you can access elements with that same bracket notation, but I want to call your attention to something um, about what it's doing. It's returning a list of length one, um, which you might say, uh, well, actually, like I thought this was a um, just a Boolean value, just like one Boolean value. And you'd be right, you need to use this double bracket notation to get just that item by itself, not in a list. So if you use the single bracket notation, what you get back is a list. If you use the double bracket notation, you get whatever the actual like uh, object of that index is. So if we look at the class of this object, um, you'll see that this is just a logical element. Um, I'll pause. Are there questions about that? I know that that's kind of a confusing spot that a lot of people need to learn kind of a few times. Okay, I think I'll keep going. Um, but so while we're still on the topic of like declaring variables, um, I wanna talk about one more type of uh, variable that is really commonly used in R, which are called factors. Um, and you can construct them with this factor command. And then I'm just gonna insert a, a character vector um, but what's going to be kind of special about this character vector is that I'm going to repeat myself a couple times. And the reason that um, this matters is because if this were just a character vector, uh, when you actually think about how it's stored on the machine, you know, a character vector is basically like, in this case, I have what, six entries. Um, and so it would be six, like, uh, sections of probably eight bits, I think. It might be more. But anyway, it's allocating like an even amount of space to all of those um, of the size needed to store a character um, or a string. And whereas a factor is saying, hey, look, I can recognize that like A is getting repeated here and that there's actually only a few levels here. There's only three distinct values this thing takes on. 
And so it just does some indexing behind the scenes to cut down on the amount of space that you need to use in your computer's memory to store that data. This can be really useful when you're analyzing um, like categorical types of data. Like if you have survey data is the example that comes to mind for me and people had a drop down selection option where there were only three options, you don't need to repeat like uh, whatever those strings were over and over in a character vector and use up all of that space, you can do it more efficiently using a factor. And there are certain benefits that come with using factors, um, just in terms of making the data analysis easier later. One function that's useful to know about is the levels function. So you can get the levels um, of the factor and know what they are. Um, and then I want to show you what some simple vector functions are that are useful and come up a lot. So um, if you remember what x was, it's this vector of um, several numbers. We can do things like summing up all the numbers in x. We can take the average of x. Oops, there we go. Um, we can get the standard deviation of x. We can get the variance of x. I'm really just throwing out a lot of things that are common in math and statistics that you might run into in your regular old coding analysis um, for you know just any data. This is the absolute value of x, which we didn't have any negative numbers, but um, you might run into. You can get the minimum element of x. You can get the maximum element of x. And uh, just like before, all of these, you can get the help pages on them. So if it doesn't work exactly like you thought it did, um, you can find out like a lot more detail. And of course, there's examples for how you can use these functions that um, you should refer to if you're getting stuck or just want to know more. I'll pause. Are there questions? I have a quick question. Sorry to make you yeah. go back. You explained yeah, the difference between the two brackets versus the one. Can you yes, go? Yes, right, can you right. Okay, yeah. So um, if we're looking at this list, um, this list in element like one, two, uh, three, and four, and five, it has uh, these different objects. The first one is just a logical object, and so is the second one. And then we've got this not, not a number object, um, not applicable, and then null. And when we go to access it with a single bracket, um, you'll see, so this is just a heads up. The, like we're getting more than just the logical object. This is, this when you see this double bracket syntax, it should uh, set off alarm bells like, oh, I'm working with a list. This is definitely a list. So if I check the class of this object, this is a list, even though I knew that it's a logical object. You should think of this as like a list with just one logical object in it, because um, like I can actually go get that first object out of it um, with that double bracket syntax. And that's just this single value true. I could also have gotten the object directly without being wrapped in a list with those double brackets. Um, so whenever you use these single brackets with a list, it's going to give you back a list. And if you want just an object, you need to use those double brackets. Um, so the list is kind of acting like a wrapper around uh, different whatever the objects are in the list. And its primary utility is to be able to store objects of different kinds, different types next to each other um, that aren't all you know, the same type, like how x is all numeric values. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. And then what does class mean? Right, so class is telling you um, like the type of the variable. So there's a couple different um, type like types of uh, variables that you can have in R. Um, I think this mentions which ones. Yeah, th so there's like, you can have matrix, arrays, functions, um, and like numeric values. You can have lists, um, but there's like only a couple really basic types of classes or types that objects can have. These are just some examples, but again, it's telling you like, um, like they construct this matrix in this example and they're when you put in class of this thing um oh let's see this is actually a bit more complicated let's not talk about that that's a really complicated example but um yeah the class 
just helps you know what kind of object you're working with. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Let's see. Okay, so now I want to talk about declaring functions. Um, so functions are really one of those things that takes your programming like to the next level when you're first starting. Like so far, we've been able to like record variables and do some operations to them, but um, we haven't really like automated our entire job yet. Like we haven't, you know, done a lot of automation for anything yet. Um, and it's really functions that's going to help us do that. So I'm just going to show an example of a function um, that calculates the uh, average absolute difference between two vectors. Um, and so this function is going to take two arguments called x and y. And what it's going to do um, to them is it's going to take the average with the mean function of the absolute uh, value of the difference between x and y. And so um, I'll like. I can select this and click run and that declares the function you'll see it like now over in in my environment pane i've got this uh average absolute diff function um and it shows you that like it basically just says it's a function um and so if we use that with our uh vectors that we already have you you'll see like it shows us the average absolute difference was 3.75 which makes sense because it's like one two three five and uh, five, six, seven, eight for x and y. Um, and we can use it with different uh, values. So I can just put in, um, you know, different values here um, and run this. And I'll get the, you know, this operation applied to whatever I put in here. Um, and so I can keep changing these values. I can put in whatever I want pretty much as long as they're two vectors or numbers that can be subtracted from each other and then run through the absolute value function and the mean function. Um, and so now, like if I wanted to do this over and over again, I have a shortcut to being able to do that. Like I don't have to write out this every time. I can just call this function each time I want to do that. Um, so this is um, just an example of a function. Um, sometimes you'll see people put um, a return around the item at the end that they're deliberately trying to return uh, from the function. It's not necessary. You don't have to, but I'm telling you that they do that because um, sometimes you'll see it in code and I just want you to know what it means if you're seeing it. Um, and the other thing that I want to cover in terms of functions is that you can give them, uh, give the parameters or the arguments to a function default values. So um, I'm going to make a function uh, called say hi. And I'm going to give it a argument called string or stir. And then I'm going to give it a default value high like this. And um, whatever the string is, I'm going to print the string. And OK, let me declare high. So now I don't even need to tell it what the string is. It just knows that I wanted high because I didn't specify what the string was. But if I wanted to do something else, I can put in whatever string I want. I can also use this more formal syntax to specify um, something else. So uh, like if I want to be really clear about which argument I'm specifying, um, then I can use this stir equals to specify that uh, argument. And that's really useful when you're having a lot of different uh, function arguments that you need to be careful about uh, declaring. Um, so that's what I wanted to say about functions. They are really, really useful, um, but not too hard to, I think, uh, get the hang of at the beginning, I think. Um, if there's questions about functions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll talk about some basic logic stuff. Um, I just had a quick yeah. question. Yeah. Um, is there a reason why you went to the next line after the bracket in the average absolute difference function that you mm -hmm. wrote? Oh, um, no, just style, really. That's okay. like more common style. Um, I think what Sarah is suggesting is like, you can also declare your function to look like that. And that's totally fine. Um, okay. That's totally allowable. And like, you see people do that. Typically, when a function like starts to get really long or more than you can fit on one line and a few characters, people like to break it up um, by adding several lines. So like, if I wanted to do... Like I could change x in here on the previous line or something, and then this function is doing something else. It's now 
you know, the average absolute difference of X times two and, the, and Y. Um, so, you know, if you need more lines to do all of the operations you want to do in the function, then you can add them uh, above. But if you only need one line in your function, you can write it as uh, Sarah was suggesting, like just all in one line. You don't need that enter between uh, the bracket and the contents of the function. Um, so another really useful thing um, in R is the ability to do some code based on a condition or different code if that condition is false. So these are um, usually what you see is the if else uh, syntax or just sometimes if. Um, so I'll start with like a really, really contrived example, but um, I think just it's useful to see what's going on. So if true, then we're going to print high. And true is true, so like it's going to print high. Um, but if true is like if what we put in this uh, parentheses right here is false, then it doesn't do it. It just like skips that code. Um, so what we can say is um, like we know the value of x. We know like uh, maybe the minimum value of x is 1. So you can start getting kind of fancy in here. And you can say like if the minimum value of x is 1, then print high. Um, we could like change this first value of x to be 2, and then this condition won't be true anymore. Like if I evaluate just this part, you'll see this is false now, and we're not going to get this. Um, you can also put an else block here and um, put the curly brackets and put um, like different code. And if that condition is false, it will run that section instead. Um, let's see. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to say about um, like if else brackets. Um, I did want to talk about for loops really briefly. So um, I want to show you the syntax for using a for loop. Um, what we can do with for loops is iterate through um, some kind of vector or list of values and um, each time set a uh, variable to it, one of those values. And then just for all of those values, we'll do whatever is inside the for loop. So in this case, I'm just printing the values for uh, 1 through 10. But you can do more complicated things with a for loop um, than this. And these values could be, um, like I think uh, we can put in like uh, any vector we want here. Um, and you'll see it prints out uh, each of these uh, values. i is common to use as like this variable name because um, it stands for like iterator a lot of the time. And so if you want an iterator that goes from one to 10, um, like a lot of people will just name that variable i. And that's the variable that's changing each, side, each time inside the for loop. And one of the reasons that I think you hear a lot about like how, well, it used to be that you'd hear like you shouldn't use for loops as much in R. Um, and the reason for that is because R is considered like a functional programming language, and there's functional programming approaches to do a lot of things that you would do in for loop. I don't want to talk too much about this today because it really could be its own entire lecture. But um, like, what I want to show you is um, that you can just a very particular syntax um, about how you can pass a function as an argument to another function, um, and so. Right here, kind of as Sarah was suggesting, like we're declaring a function without those extra enters, enter or like extra line returns um, in between. And all this function does is it takes an argument called x and then it multiplies it by two and it returns that. And um, this is the function that's going to be the second argument to this function called s apply. And s apply is one of the functional programming um, features that's available in R when you just like out of the box and so what it's going to do is for each element of this 1 through 10 uh, vector, which I should tell you, this 1 through 10 is just evaluating into a vector. It's a shorthand for creating a vector really quickly of all the values between the start and the stop. So it's going to take each of these, and it's going to apply this function that multiplies by 2. And so um, like if we evaluate this, z is now this vector of all the even numbers between 2 and 20. Um, 
And really just the, the fancy part of this is the fact that you get to pass a function as an argument, like some languages don't allow you to do that in the first place. Um, and so just like I could have made a for loop that went through one through 10 and then printed like i times two or something like that, um, I'm doing that just in a different syntax uh, with this functional programming approach. Um, and I want you to know about this because it's fairly popular in R and you might see it. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then, okay. I now want to transition into like actually working with data because it's great that we can um, like create these like vectors and lists and stuff like that. But um, like, what if I actually want to work with meaningful like experimental data or observational data? Um, R is really great because it comes with a bunch of data sets built in. Um, so a bunch of these that I'm just going to show you really quickly um, are uh, the iris data set, the empty cars, the rivers, and the volcanoes data set, um, or the volcano data set. So the iris data set is um, it's a data frame with 150 measurements of these iris flowers. Um, which, you know, it probably doesn't sound like, what do I need that for? But um, it's actually pretty useful when uh, using like classification, uh, when like testing different like classification algorithms, which is a common thing in, to do in like statistics and data science. Um, and then just really briefly, this empty cars data set is like motor trend car road tests. And it just has like a bunch of features for like 32 cars from 1974. The, the reason I'm calling these data sets out in particular is because they're so commonly used in example code with uh, R. So if you want to be able to see it, um, see what the data looks like, you can use this view command and it will open up the data in another tab. Same thing with the empty cars uh, data set. Um, and then I won't do it for the, or actually for rivers, it's just a vector of river lengths. Um, Let's see, yeah. Um, so it's 141 rivers in North America um, and it shows you like the reference for where it came from. And then um, the volcano one is, I think I think it's kind of interesting because it's, um, uh, let's see. Um, it's topographic information on a volcano from New Zealand, which is where R started. Um, and so if we like look at the volcano data, it's kind of not great to look at because it's just topographic information, but um, I'll show you in a second, like a really cool way to visualize it. Um, but before we do that, I just wanna show you how you access data from inside a uh, data frame. Um, so each of these, uh, well, with the exception of river, like if we wanted to look at inside um, the iris data set, there was there is a column called sepal length, um, and if you want just that data from inside iris, then you can use it with this bracket notation. Since it's a column, it goes on the right hand side past the comma here, um, and like if you want a row, you can get the first row of data using um, like an entry that you put in here on the left hand side of the comma. So if I go back, I'm just going to close these. And then if I look at the iris data, you can see, so like this sepal length is a vector just corresponding to this column. If I look at this iris, um, you know, first row, you can see that I'm getting the, a data frame with just that one row in it. Um, and you can reference like individual data. Um, so if you wanted like the first, uh, I'll change it up. I'll use like sepal width, like the sepal width from the first entry, then you can get that. Um, so that's pulling this particular value. Out, and that's how you go about accessing data from inside a data frame. Right. So here's where I start um, talking about like plotting and um, visualizing uh, data in R. And we're going to start with um, just what's available to you in base R, because a lot of the time um, you just want to have something really quick that just like works that you don't even have to like do anything to. So this plot function a lot of the time will do that for you. Um, and it's pretty basic. It will like just show you the data in whatever format it assumes is going to be useful. 
And so here we've got this scatter plot for um, each of the like one through 140th uh, elements uh, showing us the length of that river, um, which is like kind of useful. Um, if you want a histogram of this data, you can just do hist. Um, and that's showing us something else that's also kind of useful. Um, but these are pretty like basic plots um, that, you know, they're done with the base R package and you can customize them. Um, it, that's all right though, but um, there's more sophisticated ways to plot um, that I wanna show you in a second. Before we get too far though, um, I did wanna show you like the base R, uh, the plotting that you can do just out of the box with R is pretty sophisticated. So I'm gonna couple, copy this code from the example um, from the volcanoes data set. Um, and I'm just gonna run this so you guys can see this example um, because I think it's pretty cool. So you can actually like plot topographic data like right out of the box um, using base R um, using this like filled contour command. Um, which like maybe you wouldn't know about just, you know, from, because it's kind of obscure, but um, it's just to evidence that it, looking at these example codes can be really useful to find um, ways to do things that you didn't know about or how to get started uh, creating plots like this. Um, but I wanna show something different. Um, I wanna show you like just the very beginnings of how to use ggplot2. So ggplot2 is one of those uh, packages that I asked um, that you install and uh, we'll load it using this library ggplot2 syntax. Once you've got it installed, you can run this library ggplot2. And then after you library the package, um, all of the functions that are exported from the package become available to you. And I want to do an example with um, the empty cars data set. And what I want to do is um, what I immediately noticed, like when I look at this data set, um, is like there's these different cars with different numbers of cylinders in them. And um, like I'm kind of curious about how that relates to horsepower. Um, so that's this HP column. And like I just want to know what the trend is there. I just kind of want to visualize um, if they're. I just want to see like what those two variables look like if I put them on the x and y axis. So if I put on the x axis um, the cylinders and on the y axis the horsepower, um, I'll explain in a second like what this syntax is. Um, but first, so here we've got like a different kind of plot, um, a scatter plot uh, that we made with ggplot. So what's going on with this ggplot call? I'll explain the visualization in a second, but in this ggplot call, we're passing to this function ggplot, um, the empty cars data set, the first argument is the data. And then this uh, second argument, you pass it in something evaluated by this AES function, which stands for aesthetics. And that's really defining um, how it is that you want to construct the plot. So I'm specifying on the x-axis, I want the cylinders variable, and on the y-axis, the HP, the horsepower variable. And um, it, and then, um, so this all together just defines like the base of the ggplot, which is just like a plot object that um, it hasn't been, you know, rendered yet or anything like that but it contains the data and it contains um, like an area to plot in. And then I say, I want to add um, some, a layer with points on it for like a scatter uh, plot. And that's what this gets me. Um, I still wanna kind of improve this plot a little bit. So I'm gonna show you um, just like a way, like how I would make this plot um, is I would add like uh, jitter to this plot. Um, and what that's gonna do is help me separate out, okay, so now the cylinders, I can still tell, you know, which ones are four, six, and eight, but now they're not like all right on top of each other. And I'm gonna add one more thing that helps me understand this data. Um, and that's gonna be a, uh, a box plot. And I'm gonna have to specify for this um, some aesthetics because I need to make individual blocks plots for each cylinder um, or each amount of cylinder uh, the different cars have, and I'm setting them to be a little bit transparent so that I can see the scatter plot data underneath them. 
And now I can really see there's a clear trend. Like if I look at the medians indicated in these box plots, like the more cylinders, the more horsepower, according to this data. Um, and I just wanted to go over this because I think it's a, uh, I think ggplot is a really useful way to be able to construct plots that have different layers of data visualizations. Um, and so it's really through defining like these aesthetics that you can find different ways to represent your data. Um, and then you can pass in other arguments to tune it a little bit more. I don't want to talk too much about ggplot2 because it's another one of these things that could take a whole lecture. But I wanted to show you a little bit of, about it because it might be something you see a lot of in uh, the real world. Um, so I wanted to talk about one other thing that I think you shouldn't get started in R without having seen, which is um, using linear models because that's kind of one of these bread and butter things in statistics. Um, so the model that I'm going to define um, is I'm going to continue kind of on this uh, thought uh, train that the horsepower seems to be like informed to some degree by the number of cylinders in the car. So this LM function is stands for linear model. And then I'm passing it what's called a formula. And it uses this tilde operator. So this is kind of like my y variable, like my outcome is horsepower in this model. And then I'm predicting that based on cylinders. I could have like other predictors here that I could add in, like, I don't know what's another variable. Uh, DISP stands for like engine displacement. I could add that here if I wanted to. Uh, but for now, I'm just gonna stick with like one uh, predictor. And now I've run it and now I've evaluated this model. This is a linear model. And it's telling me, like, if you're familiar with like the linear equation, like y equals mx plus b, it's telling me that b in this model would be negative 51.05, and the m would be 31.96. So this is kind of confirming my hypothesis or what I've been saying from the data, like more cylinders, more horsepower. Um, but you can st still see it in even more um, granular detail where actually now I can say that this is like statistically significant. Um, so the way to read this, first of all, what I did was I ran summary of the model. I ran this summary function on the model object. And that provides a little bit more data um, that's useful. And these asterisks next to uh, the different uh, coefficient estimates are telling us to what degree the estimates are statistically significant or not. Um, and so now I've actually made like a statistical statement about these data that um, might be useful to somebody, maybe. But um, in principle, you know, this is something we want to know a lot of the time is whether or not something is statistically significant. Um, and so that's how to do that with a linear model. Um, I also want to show you like how in these days and ages, uh, at least I would go about visualizing these coefficient estimates. Um, so I would do that using the broom package. Um, and after we load the broom package, what we can do is we call this function tidy on the model. And that actually is making us, it's called a tibble. You should think of it as very similar to a data frame. Instead of just printing this stuff out in a way that's kind of hard to uh, access, this is now like just like a data frame, an object with each of these values in it that I can reference. Um, and so I'll actually put that data into a uh, ggplot. And so I'll, for my data, like the first argument, I'll put the tidy modeled uh, outcomes. And then um, I think probably this will be a little bit opaque. I'll explain in a second. Let me just uh, write down some code. Um, but basically what I'm going to do is for each of these, I'm going to Oops. Yeah. Um, I'm going to plot the interval uh, for the, uh, the coefficient estimate. Um, so in the aesthetics, I'm defining that basically across each of the uh, horizontal rows, I'm going to want uh, those to correspond to the terms. Then I'm going to want across the x-axis, the estimate to be indicated. And then this x-end and y-end um, that I'm declaring are for these geom segments. Um, and I'm going to add one more thing for the uh, 
Gion segment. And I'll explain what this uh, 1.96 is about in a second. Um, okay. And I'm going to add a Gion point for the coefficient estimate. So we're going to start there. And there we go. Okay. So uh, explaining what we've actually got, we've got like terms going across the y-axis. Here's like the cylinders term and here's the intercept term. And then the y end and x end parameters and then the x inside this geom segment are defining the upper and lower values of these uh, line segments, the ranges that are being shown. And so like a different way to see that these results are statistically significant is the fact that these segments don't overlap with zero. And then if you're wondering where that like 1.96 comes from, um, that's just like a uh, number that's important because if you have a standardized normal distribution, it's 1.96 times the standard deviation that gives you the 95% confidence intervals. So we're saying zero is outside the 95% confidence interval for these estimates. Um, or like it's statistically significant. Um, and I'll just add a few more things to this plot because a plot is uh, more useful if it has a title. Um, so we're gonna title it uh, regression coefficient estimates. Um, and I think that's enough for us. I think if we just do that, that will be an improvement. Okay. Um, so I see that we're coming up to time but I did really want to get through a little bit with that data set that I included. So let's do that and I'll try to go quickly. So uh, yeah, please. Um, there were um, some questions about oh, yeah. the drag and drop movement that you did with the data set um, to get it in the right oh, yeah. spot. So could you mm -hmm. just go through that again before opening it? Yeah. So um, when I made the new project, um, I what created this folder like intro to R um, that has like this intro.r script. And I just drag and dropped the CSV file into this same directory so that it would be here. I had this uh, file on my desktop earlier, but like if you download it to your downloads, just drag it from uh, your downloads into like wherever this project folder is located, wherever you set up your project. If it's on your desktop, on your desktop, but if it's somewhere else, there. Yeah. Were there other questions? Okay. I don't have any in the chat, but I don't know if anyone has any. Okay. Um, then I'll move forward. So we're going to use this function read.csv um, to read in the data. Um, so that read it in. Um, let me just show you in case you aren't actually familiar with like what CSV data looks like. It's often, um, well, it stands for comma separated values. And that's exactly what it is. It's like on one line, you have a bunch of different values and they're comma separated mm -hmm. and they form tables. Most people interact with these in Excel. Um, and if we like view the data, it's actually defining like tables of data. Um, that you know, every line has to have the same number of comma separated values on it in order for it to be a table. Um, but this is a really common file format for tables of data. So um, we can view the data frame like I showed you. We can do things like we can get the dimensions of the data frame. Um, and one of the things I want to do is clean the column names of the data frame. Um, so if we library janitor, um, then if we say that uh, data frame will have um, cleaned names, then if we go to look at the data frame, it, it's removed things like periods and a lot of the casing has gone to lower, or all of it's gone to lowercase. And this just helps with accessing the elements in R because a lot of times uh, periods can kind of mess things up a little bit. Um, so now I'm going to start using dplyr um, to start uh, manipulating the data. Um, and one of the things that comes with dplyr is this pipe command. Um, so earlier we were doing things like uh, min of x. And this is totally fine. x is still like this vector. Um, but 
this pipe operator gets used in a lot of R code um, to basically pass uh, from the left-hand side into uh, the function on the right-hand side as an argument. So you'll see that basically this and this are saying the same things. Why would I ever prefer like to do it this way if they're exactly the same? Well, it's because it lets me keep um, like chaining on commands like this. And instead of having a really long, ugly command, it's easier to have this pipe operator, the percent and then the greater than and then the percent um, to help split up your code. So I'm going to use that, and I'm going to start to use some functions from dplyr. So if we look at this um, data frame, one of the things that I noticed about it when I was going through it was like a lot of these businesses totally like, I mean, they look really interesting, and I um, I'm kind of curious about all of them. But there's one like right at the top here that like I tried to look it up. And like, I wasn't sure if not yet is a real business. Like, I feel like not yet, it, maybe they mean it doesn't exist yet. And so I don't want that to actually like influence my analysis. So I'm gonna remove that from my data set. Um, and I'm just gonna do that by filtering for all the businesses whose business name is not, not yet. Um, and so here I'm using the not equal to operator to check for like business name is not, uh, not yet. And now if we like go back and look at the data frame, um, then you can see like it's no longer here. It was the second item and it's gone. Um, so this is like a really common data analysis thing to just need to remove something from your data set. Um, and then the other thing that I noticed about this data frame when I was looking at it was the zip codes are kind of messed up. Zip codes are supposed to be five digits and like at first I thought maybe that was just a problem reading it into R, but if we actually go and look, no, like in the original data set from the boston.gov website, like there are all four digits in there. Um, so we need to correct that. Um, so the way that I'm gonna do that is uh, with a mutate from dplyr, um, and I'm gonna rewrite this business zip code uh, column with um, the output of this if else command. So. Um, I realize this is getting like more complex, but I wanted to show you some examples of like some real world um, analyses that you might have to do. So what I'm going to do is if the business zip code has four characters as evidenced by the output of the nchar command, then I'm just going to combine that with a zero in front of the business zip code. And then if it didn't have uh, four characters, then it probably had five and it was already fine. And so we just return uh, business zip code. This is all inside, like this right here is all inside this if else. So what this if else does is it evaluates for a, a whole vector of values. If each one is true or false, if it's true, it does this. And if it's false, it does this. And so we're going to get back a vector that's uh, values returned from either like adding a zero in front if it needed it, or just the original if it already had five digits. And so we can run that. And then we can look at our data and go over to the business zip code. And you can see now they all have, oh, wait, let's see, I scrolled. Um, now they all have five digits like they're supposed to. And it's only because we're in the like Massachusetts, Boston area that we know that these are probably supposed to be zeros because like leading zeros will get dropped off of numbers often in something like Excel. So now I want to do um, one more thing that I think, let me check, but um, yeah, I think this might be like the last thing I want to do because um, I mean, I have a bit more, but I want to have time for questions. So what I want to do is I just want to sum up for each of these zip codes um, how many uh, women-owned businesses there were. So I'm going to group by the business zip code. Um, with, uh, and so what this group by function is doing is it's basically going to split the data frame into a bunch of different groups and it's going to perform uh, this next step with summarize um, on each one of them. This, and what I'm doing inside summarize is I'm going to create a new column with um, the value from this n function in there. And that n function is going to have how many um, observations there were in that zip code. 
So if I look at this zip counts object now, you can see like I've got each zip code and then I've got how many observations there were. So like 02116 had 18 and 02118 had 11. I can use a range from dplyr R um, with a column name or like minus a column name for ascending or descending um, to order the data frame. So now when I look at zip counts, you'll see that those values that had really high counts are at the top, which I like to see just in terms of formatting. Um, and I, you know, did all this last night and I looked at what these values actually are. And so this is like um, Back Bay and South Boston is where these are located. Um, but this is a really common like type of analysis task where you have to take the data and you know massage it in some kind of different way. For example, it has missing zeros or something like that. And then you wanna somehow like condense it. You wanna like run statistics on it or you wanna count things for however many times they appear. Um, and dplyr is really great at getting you started in doing that. Um, and it provides a pretty usable, friendly syntax to do that. So I'll go ahead and stop here. Um, and if there's any questions, I'm really happy to answer them. Are there parts I need to go over like again or in more detail because it was just too fast, too, like too much at once? Looks like Emery has a question. Oh yeah. Yeah, so mostly it's just like a, just a basic sort of thing. Um, yeah. If we want to experiment with different data sets, then uh, all we need is just the, the data set as a comma, uh, delimited uh -huh. uh, file. Okay. Yeah, right. And, um, you know, for like, if you have comma separated, like a CSV file, that's like great to get started with. You can definitely use that. Um, but if you have Excel file, check out the read Excel package. Or if you have SPSS or Stata or SAS files, the Haven package um will open those for you and like i know that people in public health are always dealing with sas and stata and spss files so those the haven package is really helpful for that um, these two are both from the tidyverse and uh all of the packages that are on the tidyverse um have these really useful uh documentation pages um, the, I definitely recommend that you check out. So like if I open this URL open, open it up, um, there's these documentation pages that uh, you can get to. And there's even like a cheat sheet for dplyr um, that shows you like all the different things you can do. So today I was really focused on like group by and summarize. Like you can see summarize is the first thing and then group by is the second thing. But there's a whole lot more you can do. And I just wanted to show you like a little bit because I feel like that's the most representative of what data analysis typically looks like. Um, but, you know, and in the tidyverse, which is, I would recommend checking out the tidyverse because it does a lot of things. Like if you need a package specifically for dealing with factors or strings um, or, I mean, all sorts of different things, um, then the tidyverse like has lots of options to help you. So like if I go to that one that I mentioned earlier, like Haven for SAS, SPSS, and Stata files, you can see the syntax really is just like library Haven, read SAS, and then you put in your SAS file if you have SAS files, you know, um, or, or whatever kind of file you have. And it's about that simple for read Excel too. Um, so, so that's how you get like your, your own data sets into, um, uh, into R, yeah. So like with with read Excel, you specify like the XLSX file, and then you specify like what sheet you want to read from that file, and that will turn into a data frame in uh, in R or a tibble, really. But um, tibbles are just better data frames. You don't need to worry about it too much right now. Thanks. Yeah. 
Oh, I did want to do one shameless self-promoting. I'm so glad that we had that dead time um, because, and I'll put this on the chat. I have been keeping, I guess since 2018, an article on my website about getting started in R. And I try to share this with people when, you know, the opportunity permits. Um, and this has a lot of re references and resources for pretty much all levels. Um, so if you're like a beginner, like these beginner resources are gonna be the most useful to you. Um, like for example, this learn X and Y minutes is very similar to today's talk. Like it just goes through like step-by-step step and shows you like a lot of commands that you can run. But then like swirl is like this interactive thing that you can run in your R console. Um, and it will teach you like inside our studio how to use our studio. Um, and then there's like books and stuff like that. And then there's like a lot more, like there's technical documentation for like specific topics and then like topic specific resources that I've uh, been aggregating. And like, if you, if you have some specific direction that you're trying to go with this, like if you wanna analyze survey data or like you wanna do like forecasting or something, there's probably something in here that you can do. I didn't mention this today, but um, like Shiny uh, lets you build web applications in R and there's R Markdown for building reports. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to share this because let's see, how do I get to the chat? Um, Okay. I already put it in the chat. I kind of copied you. off your screen. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. No problem. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so I'll close this. I would also say if you have any questions that aren't directly related to today's material, I know we said that if you had questions coming into this, we would be happy to answer those yeah. now as well. Hi, this is Chrissy. I, um, hi, Chris, uh, hi, Christian. Thanks for, uh, for leading this workshop. This has been fantastic. I do have a general question about the RFs. And, Apologies if you covered it in the very beginning because I did join slightly late. Um, but I do have our studio, but I also have the R project. Is there, uh -huh. um, they're both open source. And yeah. while, I'll, uh, well, with testing, I've been playing around really for both. Uh -huh. Is there really a significant difference in terms of the construction and the output of yeah. the analysis? Yeah, so um, you've got the situation correct. Like R and R Studio are each independent, free, open source software uh, projects that you can have. Um, R is like the programming language, and R Studio, R Studio is what's called an integrated development environment for R. Um, and so R Studio. Like the way I think about it is when you get R, you really only get this lower left-hand pane. And when you've got R Studio, you've got all these other like windows and drop downs that are going to help you do what you already need to do to uh, create like a clean working R project. Um, so when you're using R Studio, it's really that you're getting a lot of helper kind of functionalities. Like you're getting, buttons that help you create our projects more quickly and you're getting buttons that help you like view the data from inside your R sessions uh, more easily um, and things like that. So you don't strictly need R Studio, but R Studio, I mean, I would highly recommend that you use R Studio because it will help you, um, I think, learn R more quickly because uh, it does provide a lot of features to help you um, use R and to help you like understand what you're doing. Um, whereas like using R by itself, a lot of the times it's just less clear like what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and our studio helps you make that clear. It's also one of those things where you're going to find that if you watch like a lot of tutorials or other people's examples, um, they might reference like how they did things in our studio that are a little bit more difficult to do just in R. All of that said, like if you're a fairly advanced programmer, 
I would say like you can get away with just using R by itself without using R Studio, but it's just harder. It's just like you don't have as much help, if that makes sense. All right. Oh, okay. Thanks, Christian. That's actually that was actually really good to know. So in a way, the um, uh, our project could be um, a nice barometer of um, when I can um, when I could graduate to the next level. <laughs> Maybe, maybe. I don't know. So, I mean, me personally, I use RStudio most of the time these days, but if I'm just doing something really quick, like sometimes if I just have like five or six lines I want to run in R and I don't need to save it anywhere, I'll just run it in R on the terminal. But that's just me. I think most people are going to tell you you should probably use RStudio. Okay, good. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. So uh, Molly is asking like how you can even see the graphics in regular R. I think if you open R, like as we're discussing the heresy, don't do this, um, then like when you, gosh, like I think if you just like plot something out of the box, it pops up in its own viewer. It's an, oh, Nicole, you said that. Okay, yeah. It pops open in its own separate thing. And so this is one of the annoying things, like where our studio like has a pane dedicated for it that um, kind of keeps things more clean. And the other thing is like in our studio, there's like a save button for the graphic that you've created. Like you can literally, like whenever we go over to this plots, I should have mentioned this earlier. When you go to export, you can just click save as image or save as PDF and like save the visualization that you've created. I don't think that button exists in base R, but anyway. Um, I'm pretty sure someone can tell me I'm wrong if I'm wrong. Thank you all so much for coming. I appreciate it a lot. I'm glad you guys seem to be getting something from this. And, um, yeah. Yes. What WD is saying, um, our studio, for sure. So like, when he's saying package building, um, you know, it's kind of like peeking behind the scenes, but like whenever you're loading one of these projects, you actually could build your own, or sorry, whenever you're loading a package like Room or something, or like ggplot2, when you library something, you can build your own things like that. That, you know, if you get them on CRAM, the, um, the, organization that hosts like a lot of the R packages, um, then you can just install those packages the same way that, you know, all the packages we use today are used and like you can release your own packages. That's how all of this has been done so far. Yeah. Yeah, like, I mean, I think maybe one of the most useful things is actually like the files viewer, because like what Walter is saying, if you just use R, then you need to have like a terminal open, you need to have like a file window open, you basically need to recreate each of these panes that are in our studio on your own somehow. And to, you know, probably not do it as well as they did it, <laughs> I think is usually the issue. Let me think, was there anything else that I was like super eager to cover? I think, I mean, there's a lot more you can do, but how many functions? Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> okay, Molly, I mean, your question is really, you're right that it's complicated to answer because um, Number one, like a lot of the functions that people write will depend on other functions. And those functions themselves depend on other functions. And it's kind of a rabbit hole um, 
a long way down. Yes, you'll have uh, access to the recording. We'll upload it to YouTube and um, make sure to share it with everyone. Um, so I, going back to the other question about like, how many functions like will you need? I asked this question on Stack Overflow, um, let's see, like years and years and years ago um, about like how to visualize like function dependencies in R. Let's see, I asked this like four years ago. Um, and like the answers that some different people and I came up with like looked like this so that you could just see how all of your functions like depended on other functions. I was working on a package at the time to like analyze Qualtrics surveys. Um, and so I, like, I just wanted to be able to do this kind of for fun. And like, this was what like one function looked like in terms of all the other functions that it called. Um, and it just had like tons and tons of dependencies, but like it's, you get there by building like lots of small functions that, um, you know, help you do some complex job. Um, but, you know, Molly, like, I think the answer is like as many as you want it to or as few as you want it to. Like if you just, I mean, it depends on how complex of an analysis you want to do and like how nitpicky you want to be about it. Um, because I think you'll find like some analyses, like if all you want to do is run a linear model and like plot the results or something, like you, you can be done with that pretty quickly. Uh, but if you need to build like your whole own custom, like, you know, statistical model or something, it's gonna take you a lot of functions. <laughs> so. Okay, good. If no one else has any questions, I kind of have a question for you guys in the sense of, are there certain disciplines that you're working in or workshops that you would like to see in the future um, that build off of what we've done today um, or like towards your ultimate goal of using R? ML, yeah. 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 Those last three suggestions, like I think each could really be like talks on their own. Like I think, you know, cleaning data, tidying data is one of those things. Yeah, multiple regression, yeah. Tidying data is one of those things that like it's not, doesn't sound super fun, but it, but once you learn like a few of the commands that save you a lot of time, you're like, I wish I'd spent the time on this earlier to learn all these useful commands and packages that are out there. Um, and yeah, you know, there's a ton to do with machine learning in R. There's always new packages coming out. There are some big ones that I think we could talk about, like especially the tidy models framework. Um, that one's really useful because it's just like ggplot kind of gives you one syntax for interacting with and building lots of different kinds of plots. Um, the tidy models package gives you like one syntax for working with and building lots of different kinds of statistical models. Um, so I think we should talk about that at some point if we can figure some like a timeout for it. And then yeah, data visualization. We can have a data visualization workshop at some point. I think that just makes sense. Um, I don't know a lot about Power BI, but yeah, and I'm, but I bet there's integrations that like you might be interested in. Um, like I feel like I'm, let's see. Oh, did you have a question, Sharon? Yeah, before we get, super advanced um, yeah. if, if people know like I guess uh, folks who are indigenous or um, sort of versed in like different cultural understandings of programming and tech that'd be a really interesting conversation yeah. to have before we get super technical just to like see how just how their disciplines interact with this but like yeah. I've, I've been super curious about that so thank you Yeah. 
So like indigenous people who use R or like people who use R to study like, like I'm thinking of like, you know, like critical race theory and sociology and stuff like that. Like a bit of both, right? Like. Yep. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, we will brainstorm on that and figure out like, if you have suggestions on people we could reach out to, like the fit that category, we'll try to brainstorm who we can think of too. And like, but like, feel free to email us if there's like people you can think of who fit that category. Um, because we are in the process of trying to like book other speakers and figure out who we can bring in to talk, give guest lectures and things like that. So I think that would be great. All right, well, thank you so much everybody for coming. I really appreciate it. I think, um, I know that we've got some talks. Yes, that's the right email. Um, I know we've got some talks lined up for August that we'll be emailing you about. We're working on setting up more things um, and we'll email you when we have the details figured out. Um, Nicole, is there anything else that I'm missing that we should be advertising? I just want to mention that um, some of our talk will be not at, like won't be targeted directly at beginners, but I really encourage you to go to those talks just to see what is possible in R and if you have questions about how you build to that point or if it you know is a tool that you um, end up being very interested in, it can definitely help um, streamline your R progress because then you can really work towards that goal. So essentially just don't be intimidated if you see something you don't recognize because that still happens to me all the time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I hope that this wasn't too intimidating because I was really trying to like, part of me is like, I really need to give you guys the foundations of um, what you absolutely need to be able to program and and there's a lot of stuff to cover that's just foundational. And then there's also like what you're going to see in the wild. Um, and so like ggplot2 is kind of a little bit more complex. dplyr is kind of like another step, like a little bit of a step up from just base R, just declaring variables and functions and stuff like that. So I wanted to give you a bit of both. Um, so I hope that was, you know, I hope that it wasn't entirely too intimidating. And I hope that there were parts you could really get uh, value out of. So I hope you guys all do great things in R in the coming weeks. So, yeah. Okay, well, I think I'll stop screen sharing and we'll um, all take off to continue the rest of our days. So thank you all so much for coming. Have a wonderful day. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that went pretty well. Do you want to kill the recording? Oh, yeah. <clears throat>